Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. I'm going to be talking about relationships. I'll get to that in just a moment. Your value to others comes from what you provide. This is a complex thought, and I hope that you benefit from the video. If you want to listen to the podcast, you're welcome to do that. And of course, if you want to watch or read the show notes, rather, you can go to episode 400. By the way, if you don't mind, if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel, that will help us to reach more people. And that's what we want to do is spread the practical message of Christ to as many people as possible. All right, I got a podcast here. Let's go. The most important people are those who do things for others. If you have something to give, if you have a product, if you have a service, for example, people will want what you have to offer. Generally speaking, most people will leave you alone if you have nothing to give. Now, this concept might sound strange on the surface, but it is how God wants us to live in his world. He asks us to love him and to love others more than ourselves. Thus, our instinctive gospel-centered orientation should always be outward, not inward. But when you think about what I just said, it is a complicated, a complex thought to have. And so what I want to do in this podcast is is talk about this concept of of people, I'm, I'm going to say it this way, people using you for what you have. That is a raw way, maybe a crude way of saying it, but if you have something of value, you can have many friends. I have always said that a man with a truck has a lot of friends, and that's how it works in our world. But this can also be frustrating to a few people, especially those who are lonely, where people are not intruding into their lives and helping them. And that's why I said this idea that I'm putting forth here is complex, and so I want to work through it in this podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Rick Thomas. You're listening to the Life Over Coffee podcast. I'm very glad that you're here. By the way, if you haven't written a review for our podcast, would you do that? That would benefit us so much so that we can continue to spread the fame of Christ, practically speaking, globally. The more reviews we have, the more people that are listening, uh, the more the algorithms smile on us and we're able to reach more people, which is the point of it all. If you want to watch a video of this podcast that I'm doing, you have three options. You can watch the video on YouTube, you can watch it on Rumble, and you can also watch it inside the show notes that I have here. And so you can choose to read, watch, or listen. These show notes are episode 400, and again, I titled this, Your Value to Others Comes from What You Provide. I have a long way to go here, so let me get into this complex subject. And I want to begin it by asking a question. How many people do you visit regularly, or maybe just one time, but how many people do you visit because they have something to offer? I mean, the Walmart clerk, the paint store team member, the grocery checkout lady, the bank teller, your favorite barista. I am sure that in 30 minutes you could come up with dozens of these helpful people who serve you. Now that is the way life is. I mean, I can't even fathom how many people Uh, that serve me. And I thank God they are in these places, these offices, these institutions uh, where they provide a service to me. And now let's say that maybe all of them, all of those people that you visit, there's a grocery store uh, nearby that I visit from time to time. And there's a, a little elderly lady who is very feisty and spunky in all the good ways. And I've enjoyed talking to her But imagine if she lost her job or your favorite person that serves you. You would be sad. I would be sad. But your relationship with them would probably end. Because you did not go to these businesses because they were there, but because of what they provided for you. 
as much as I enjoy talking to this little spunky lady, I don't go to this particular grocery store because she's there. I go there with another objective. I want to get uh, food to bring home to my family. And so if I went there one day and, and she wasn't there and I were to ask around and they say she passed away, for example, but say she went to another job, she found a, a better job at a better grocery store, well, I would be sad. Uh, but that was not the main reason that I went there. For example, another example, rather, I'm in the counseling business and I, I have thousands of friends. I mean, I'm old. And, and so I have interacted with a, a lot of people. And that's not just in the counseling office. That is on the internet. That is also public speaking. But if I stopped counseling my so-called thousands of friends, and probably I should put that in air quotes, they would disappear for the most part. They want what I have, which is intellectual property. That is my product. That is, that is the produce that the grocery store lady provides for me. Well, what I have is intellectual property. They would not even know I existed if, if it were not for what I provided. I mean, think about it. I, I would imagine that 99 plus percent of you would not know anything about me if I did not do what I do now. Now, this dawned on me a few, a few years ago, and I realized that folks were using me, and I'm putting that in air quotes because I have no negative connotation for that at all. I don't struggle with what I'm sharing with you because I've had to work through it, and I, I have. I am very glad to be able to serve the body of Christ with what God has given to me. But when I initially started thinking about this, that people came to me for what I provided, I became discouraged. In fact, one lady told me during a counseling session that I was rent-a-friend. Now, that's, those are her words, not, not mine. In fact, I came home that day and wrote an article on it, and you can find it on our website. And when she said, you know, hey, Rick, you're just rent-a-friend, and so she dials me up every time her and her husband are going through a rough patch or when she has something that she needs to run by someone, she, she dials up her rent-a-friend and, and I meet with her. I met with her many times and, and it, I laughed, she laughed, but then I thought about it and I stopped laughing. I realized if it were not for my service, she too would have no interest in me. Now, this problem is fundamental for all of us. This is something that we're going to have to think about. For example, sometimes I hear people complain something like this. We left the church and nobody sought us out. Obviously, we did not matter to them. Now, I understand this sentiment and I, I understand exactly what they're saying. I mean, I have left churches before and and I imagine many of you have as well, but what the person is saying is not precisely on target. Some of the folks, some of the church folks did care for them. They did care about them. They did enjoy their company. But this, this person, this couple, this family, they left and they were no longer in their sphere network. Now, I want to talk about that for a little bit here because this is important, this idea of sphere network or, or circles. We live in these circles that we travel, well-trodden paths. I mean, maybe you could think about it this way. Would you track down your Walmart clerk after she left your routine, those places that you typically visit? If my spunky... Uh, grocery clerk lady left the grocery store, would I track her down to visit with her? No. I mean, honestly, I would not. It doesn't mean that I, doesn't, that I don't like her. It doesn't mean that at all. I, as I said, I enjoy uh, communicating with her as I pass through her checkout line. Few people will seek you out if you leave the church where you mainly were connected because you have to think about, think about it like this. They met you at, at corporate church meetings, like 
on Sunday morning. They also met you at small group gatherings. They met you at at church functions, and, and you were in their loop. That's what I mean by circle. But what happened is you left the church, and so you're no longer in their regular travel routes. Hardly would anyone add another pen on their friendship map to see you because you're outside of their normal routine. I mean, would you? I have already confessed that I wouldn't with my grocery clerk because that's not how life works, and that's not scalable. I mean, if you leave churches and and different relationships for whatever reason, you still have a life that you have to live. You still have a routine that does not change, and you can't keep adding more and more people to your routine that aren't in your normal route. And so with that in mind, think about your life as a circle with your regular routine all around the ring. And so your routine is all around this circle. Each day, each week, each month, you go places. For example, uh, maybe you have school drop off and school pick up. You have your church where you have many functions at your church. Uh, Perhaps you have work where you go to and from 10 times a week if you work five days a week. And then you have your neighborhood where where you interact. And then you have your grocery Uh, store that you uh, frequent, as I do, and then you get gas, and then you have dentists, and maybe you have parents that you visit, and then you have many church friends that you hang out with, and then you have more. It would be interesting to just create that list. We go to a lot of places uh, during our uh, day, during our week, and our month. And then imagine that someone at your church, a church member, leaves. They go to another church where they they pin that church onto their circle. So now they're no longer traveling in your circle. And so you don't connect with them any longer. You see how easy it is to connect with somebody that is, is part of your local church? The reason for that is, is, is because they go there 52 times a year, let's say on Sunday morning, and you go there 52 times a year on Sunday morning, and so you meet 52 times a year. And then you throw in all the other social gatherings, and let's say you're in small group together, or you went to a men's group, ladies group, Bible study, whatever the functions are, you served in nursery together, but those were automatic connections that you don't have to think about, you don't have to email, uh, you don't have to call and say, hey, can I meet you Sunday morning between 10 and 12? No, that's automatically going to happen, and so it's easy to become friends within that context, but then when one of those, one of those people pull out, well, they still have that context. It's just that you're not there anymore. And so I show up at the grocery store and I uh, meet this lady friend and that's an easy connection. But if she were to leave, I would still show up at that grocery store because that is my routine. That is a pinpoint pinpoint on my relationship map. And, And so I can't just make this anomaly and go outside of that to hunt her down so that I can hang with her every so often. And so let's say that you know five people left your church and, and did similarly. There is no way you could consistently flow in and out of your routine and into their regular travel relational loop. Now perhaps they should have given you a call. Perhaps they should have written an email and say, hey, what's up, or we miss you, we, we love you. Now, that is a lesser matter for the context of what I'm communicating here, but that is something, and I think many of us, if not most of us, have had that experience. We left an environment, and then no one ever showed up or, or called or emailed. I think one of the first times that that really uh, hit home with me is when I moved from my uh, childhood home or my childhood town in uh, North Carolina, and I moved to South Carolina uh, to to go to school. And of course, I've been here for, I don't know, forever. 
But when I first did that, uh, I noticed that none of my family and none of my friends drove to Green Greenville, South Carolina to meet with me. And if I wanted to be with them, then what I had to do is I had to go all the way to North Carolina. And, and I remember uh, several of my friends would say, hey, you drove up here, but you didn't visit me. And I was thinking that, you know, I, I, I drove two hours to be in my hometown, it looked like you could get off your bum and you could you could drive five minutes to where I am at my, my mother's house. But no, they wouldn't do that. They wanted me to come to them. And that's how life works. It did bother me for a while, but I, really, I understand. I understand what they were saying. But then the other thought that I had, and I may have told one of my family members this, you know that uh, interstate that I drive up to get here? It's actually got a road that goes all the way back to Greenville, South Carolina. You know, you could come see me too. But that hardly ever happened. And so it's like out of sight, out of mind. And so you have to wrestle with this. And again, I, I know that an email, a phone call, a letter in the mail, old school, I know that's a great idea. And it would bring comfort. But honestly, that's just not how things work. And so we have to reconcile that uh, in our hearts. I mean, in God's world, the way that I think about it is like a, a large vineyard. And sometimes he moves his laborers to different spots of the field. I mean, we see this a lot in the, in the Bible. For example, Abraham, he was called from the Ur of the Chaldees to go to a place that he did not know of. I mean, that was a big move for him. He left. Elijah did that as well. He moved around a lot. He went to different places. Now, John the Baptist was probably the most nomadic of them all. And so God is always moving the pieces in his vineyard. And so we are here for a time, and this is where we serve, and then we move to another place. And so I do not see this as bad news. And this is what I want to add, really add. And I want you to think about this. I don't even see it as a separation. I don't. It's not an separa a separation as much as it is an expansion. And I would like for you to think about that. It's an expansion of relationships. It's an expansion of memories. And it's an expansion of the Lord's good work. John Dunn wrote about this. He's one of my favorite poets. And he wrote a poem called A Valediction Forbidding Mourning. And he wrote this poem, as I understand the context, because he was getting ready to leave. Now, he lived hundreds of years ago, and so leaving could be 60 days or so because uh, it was a slow process to go uh, many miles away, hundreds of miles away. And so he wrote a poem, and the poem was a valediction forbidding mourning. He wrote it to his wife. He said, I don't want you to mourn because I am leaving. And that is really the big idea that I'm saying here, that we should not mourn because there is a separation. And this is one of the lines from John Donne's poem, A Valediction Forbidding Mourning. It is an awesome poem. I have it linked here, by the way, uh, so you can get on it and read it, or you can just uh, research, uh, search for it and you'll find the entire poem. But here's, here's a line here. He says, our souls, talking to his wife, our souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach. This is not a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinnest beat. That is an awesome line. He did not see separating from his wife as a separation. He saw it as an expansion. And all the places that I have been, that's the way that I think about it. It's an expansion of relationships. I carry them in my heart. It's an expansion of memories. So many memories that we, we made wherever we were laboring together. And it's an expansion of God's work when he moves you to another location. This is episode 400, and the title of it is, Your Value to Others Comes from What You Provide. And I am saying that that is a good thing. By the way, this is on the heels of the last podcast I did, 
and it's episode 399, and the title of it is How to Identify and Benefit from Genuine Relationships. Because we have two types of relationships, uh, for context of what I'm saying here, in our lives. We have our most genuine relationships, which are tight. That's our inner circle, and it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you go. Those relationships are all, always either real-time FaceTime or email or a phone call, but those are your long-term relationships. Now, that number is quite few, of course, because you really can't steward genuine relationships if they are reciprocal, as I talked about in episode 399. And then there are these other relationships, and that number is crazy big. And that's what I'm talking about here. And the reason it's big, or if it gets bigger, is because you have something to provide. The lady at the grocery store has lots of friends, and I put that in air quotes, probably has more than I. Thousands of people go to that uh, grocery store. Many of them have seen her, and they appreciate her, probably love her, care for her, thankful that she is there, enjoy interacting with her. That's a great thing. That's a good thing. But n I would imagine none of them are inside that er uh, in inner circle of friends. And that's a different kind of relationship. And so episode 400 here, your value to others comes from what you provide. And so I want to give you six helpful tips to think about this concept. Number one, when separation happens, there is a void, no question. It can't be in any other way, especially if you built into those relationships. I mean, you move across town, you move to a new town, you move to a new city, you, you, you move to the mission field. You're going to experience loneliness. And so that is important to preset your mind to know that there will be this vacuum that will be created as you make the full transition. But here's what's going to happen you're going to create a new routine and you're going to add new people in that circle that I was talking about earlier, that relationship map, and it will fill that void. And so number one, when separation happens, there is a void. I mean, no question. Number two, at all times, remember that God values you. God values you. He cares so much for you. And, and so what you don't want to what you want to do is to remember that God will never move. He'll always value value you, but what you don't want to do, you don't want to move. You, you don't want to move away in cynicism and, and bitterness. You don't want to move away in anger because if you get become angry because of what's happening or bitter or cynical or, or any other uh, sin category that you can think of. If you become that way, then God opposes the proud. And so you will find yourself distancing from him. He will never move, but you will find yourself distancing from him. And you don't want to do that. So always remember that God values you. And so stay close to him. Don't let these sin, sin issues crop up in your life so that you start creating distance between uh, you and him. And number three, understand that most people value you conditionally. It's the way it is. A man with a truck has a lot of friends. And so that, that means for what you offer. Or if you're currently in their regular routine, if you're in their regular routine, uh, then they value you and you can have that relationship. But these aren't your most intimate friends and you have to to make a distinction there. You have to understand that. It is a natural, normal way of life, and it does not have to be wrong. Number four, do not elevate the necessity of, of jumping from their circle to your circle because you could not maintain that type of schedule. If you expect them to jump into your circle when they already have this routine in their lives, and you make that a necessity, well, don't expect them to do that because they can't. I remember when we left the church many years ago that there was a, a lady who, we, we were friends, we worked together, we, we were part of the counseling team together, and then we left, and she valued the relationship, and she became angry because we left and was not interacting with her, and I was just overwhelmed with what was going on in our new life that we created. We were planting a church at the time, and I didn't it was just not 
untenable to maintain this ongoing relationship with her and her family because we had added so many different families and we were neck deep in relationships over here. And so we don't want to elevate the necessity of, of them jumping from their circle to yours because you wouldn't do it either. I mean, you may do it with one person, but you can't do that when you have a lot of people knocking on your door wanting you to continue to stay in their life when God has ushered you to another part of the vineyard. And then number five, create your close friends wherever they are. That is the key. And so when these conditional relationships break for whatever reason, you do have genuine friends and that is absolutely essential. You want to build both friend lists. You want these most intimate acquaintances that you have that are that you can have that are reciprocal and you lean upon each other and you fuel and energize and encourage each other and you meet each other when you're down. That is gold. And then these other relationships, you want to pour into them. And so these close friends are lifelong. It's a smaller group, five or fewer, more than likely. For example, Lucia has an almost 40-year friendship with someone that she met in high school. We live states apart from them, but this lady is a true friend to my wife. When Lucia went through uh, multiple miscarriages, her friend was there on the phone, but her friend was there and she brought much comfort to my wife. That is a genuine relationship that I am talking about and that's what you want to build. So the disappointment of these conditional friends who have their own circle that you moved out of, that that won't be so overwhelming to you. Best friends stick with you while you have the opportunity to serve the public domain. I love serving the public domain, but I know who they are. Uh, they are not in my most intimate circle. And so whatever time you have, you want to serve the public domain while you benefit from those who are close to you. And so you want to love God and love others more than yourself. And so not only is it an expansion, as John Dunn talked about, but what we have the opportunity to do in God's vineyard is that we can sprinkle Christ wherever we can, hoping that the good Lord will cause growth in that part of the vineyard. This is episode 400. Your value to others comes from what you provide. And I am saying that is an excellent thing. It should be an excellent thing in our lives. Let me wrap up by asking you a few questions that you think about in context of this podcast. Number one, do you have a close friend? Do you have a close friend? Who is this person? Now, perhaps calling them today, uh, not only a good idea, but I think it would bless both of you. If you're in a place where you just don't have that intimate friend, I would encourage you, it's not the best, no question, it's a downgrade, uh, but you can jump on our forums. We have people who come to our forums who are lonely and they want to engage us. And we are so thankful that they are here. We know that we have a limited way of interacting with them, but we love interacting with them, just giving them a little bit of hope and a little bit of help for a while until they can entrench in, in some place and start building those friendships that are more intimate. Do you have a close friend? Number two, do you become discouraged by all the demands from, from those other friends, the public domain? How do you manage all the requests? It is absolutely essential if you have a lot of people that are, are, are trying to crawl into your space, it's essential to learn the value of saying no. If you don't, uh, you will burn out not only burn out, you have the potential of becoming cynical or a bitter Christian. If you do not know how to manage your time, you must find someone to help you. You can have thousands of friends asking you all sorts of things, but you have to have a, a system. You have to have a way of managing that because if you don't, you will be overwhelmed. Number three, why should every Christian have 
more people wanting something from them than the number of close, intimate friends in their lives. And I trust you would be able to answer that question and then this one as well. Why is this a good thing? Now, perhaps you can speculate on the possibilities of what the Lord could do through you by loving Him and others more. I trust that God will just continue to expand this ministry, and, and we have millions of friends where we can sprinkle, sprinkle Christ all over His vineyard. But I also know who they are, and I know who my intimate friends are as well. And then finally, number four, do you know how to live inside the ditches? In one ditch is isolation and retreating, and in the other ditch is overwhelmed by request and people problems. You want to live right in the middle. Thanks so much for listening.